Today in Canada, the wage gap between capitalists and the working class is larger than ever before. The way our society is structured, the wealthy only get wealthier and the poor remain poor. Government resources for escaping poverty are both difficult to attain and extremely repressive. Perhaps the solution lies in a much simpler plan, guaranteed minimum income. Hi, my name is Owen Minnis. Join me as we investigate what could be the ultimate solution to poverty and class division in Canada. So, what is guaranteed minimum income? The concept is quite simple. Each month, every Canadian adult would receive a check from the government for a set amount of money. This money would provide everyone with the capacity to meet their basic needs regardless of income, location, age, ethnicity, or employment status. Currently, the Canadian government spends more than $160 billion annually on various overlapping and confusing income security programs. The guaranteed minimum income model would eliminate the need for many of these programs, thus simplifying the system overall, as well as reducing the size and intrusiveness of the government. Furthermore, the model would reduce the repressive force of current social assistance programs, which keeps people relying on them, never escaping poverty. This force is due to the fact that these programs are targeted only at those who need them meaning that they are taken away as soon as one begins making a wage. Guaranteed minimum income is never taken away from anyone. It is simply balanced out gradually by income tax as one's wage increases. To understand this concept better, let's take a look at how the model would work. Meet Fred. Just like every other Canadian adult, Fred receives a minimum income of $10,000 annually. He also works a job that earns him $8,000 annually. Assuming that Fred pays an income tax of 25%, he will have to pay the government $2,000 that year. This amount is less than the minimum income, and therefore Fred gets a net income of $16,000, which is more than his salary alone. Now meet Jane. Jane also receives the minimum income of $10,000 annually. She works a job that earns her $60,000 annually. Assuming that she also pays 25% income tax, she owes the government $15,000 that year, an amount that exceeds the minimum income she is paid. This earns her a net income of $55,000. Guaranteed minimum income certainly looks appealing, but is it a feasible option for Canada? I interviewed Pam Frasch, activist with the Workers' Action Centre and the Fight for 15 and Fairness campaign, to get her insight on the matter. So we support all efforts to raise the incomes of people, um, whether they're on social assistance or whether they need disability supports or whether they're workers, we think that, you know, the number one prescription uh, needs to be raising people's income so that nobody lives in poverty. So that's fantastic. Right. The one thing that we are cautious about, however, is that we want to make sure that whatever strategies we're putting forward aren't letting uh, profitable corporations off the hook. And so, for example, if you look at, um, at you know, other jurisdictions, um, and in fact, even in, in Canada, oftentimes there are unsustainable business models that don't, pe don't pay people enough to live on, so then those folks have to go elsewhere to make ends meet. And so, whether it's food banks, uh, you know, in Canada, or food stamps in the U.S., uh, there's all kinds of corporations that are making literally millions of dollars in profit, but they're not paying their own employees enough to live. And we don't think it's fair that other workers who, who pool their resources through t paying taxes should be subsidizing the profit margins of, of corporations. Sometimes people uh, will say, oh, well, if we, everyone has a certain minimum income, then we don't need childcare, or we don't need housing, or we don't need uh, strong social programs or strong social safety nets. And so for us, we see a strong basic income as a complement to strong social supports, so that we have all of the things that, uh, that we currently have, only stronger and better. And in addition to that, we would, people need a certain basic income. And that income may come through working, or that may come through social assistance or disability supports, or whatever it is that workers need, they would get access to that. I also interviewed Aaron Woodrick, 
Federal Director for the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Let's hear what he had to say. So the idea of a guaranteed minimum income is something that has been uh, sort of bandied about in policy circles for quite some time. It's a rare policy where there seems to be a lot of interest from across the political spectrum, usually you know, groups on the left or the right, uh, like some policies and not others, but this seems to be one that there seems to be a lot of interest on all sides, and I think our group would be included in that. Um, I would say as a practical matter, uh, some of the recent studies that have come out sort of examining uh, whether or not it would be feasible and how expensive it would be uh, make us a little more skeptical because, quite frankly, it would be very expensive. In 1974, a minimum income test project was conducted by the federal government in Dauphin, Manitoba. It was found that the program led to fewer hospital visits, reduced mental health problems, higher school grades, and higher graduation rates. I was just listening to a radio program that was showing that even uh, crime is reduced by giving people uh, uh, by giving people income or access to, to decent decent uh, jobs and so forth. And so there's a situation where um, in areas of high crime where there's gun violence, when those, those folks who are implicated in that behavior were given a livable, decent income, they actually could choose to not engage in the types of behaviors that resulted in, in violent crime, and they were able to, to choose an alternative. But so much of societal challenges are based on people not having enough choice, people not having enough income, and people being forced into really terrible situations in order to make ends meet. Libertarians have also made a case for minimum income, arguing that it conforms to the idea of economic freedom. It prevents the government from making decisions about what lower income people need, and lets those people decide for themselves. I would say that um, when in doubt, you know, the government just giving money to people is usually better than the government trying to figure out, you know, what what program person wants. Uh, a lot of the time, you know, government has the best of intention by providing program X or service Y. When if the government was to just straight up give people money uh, to spend it on what they need, that would be simpler and easier, and and might cost less in the long run. So, I, I, one example is the um, the child care benefit. Uh, the, the previous government introduced, it was $100. Every family got $100 a month for every child under five. Um, the new government essentially took the same system and just adjusted it. So now you, you just get cash depending on how much money you make. So really wealthy people no longer get the 100 but people who don't earn a lot of money get several hundred. And to us, you know, that's a, that's a reasonable policy because you're not giving money to people who don't need it and you're giving more money to the people that actually do. So are the measures currently in place to alleviate poverty effective, or is there a better way? I mean, we have a very extensive uh, social safety net as it stands. I don't think we can ever say they're completely effective. I mean, uh, if there are still people who are struggling. I think the, the sort of eternal tension of when we're trying to decide the right policies is there is a, uh, there is a natural conflict between being very generous and not wanting to create incentives for people to become dependent, right? So right. we don't obviously want people to, you know, not be able to eat or, you know, have a roof over their head. But the flip side is if you make the system, you know, too comfortable, there's, you know, people tend to, they have a little bit less incentive to, to get out and find work, shall we say. So right. I think that's an eternal struggle. Um, you know, we, when we look at ways to reform the existing policies, we're always looking for ways to, to try and address the incentive issues. So you know, helping people who need help, but also recognizing that if you give them too much, um, too easily, uh, as we've seen, for example, a good example is employment insurance in Atlanta, Canada, where, you know, some people, because of the seasonal nature of the there, people will work for 14 weeks a year, qualify for EI, and then not work the rest of the year. And they do this every year. And that's mm -hmm. because that's the way the system is set up. So it's just a lesson in, when you make a system set up in a certain way, you can create incentives for people to, uh, to essentially abuse the system. It's a very subjective thing how we define work, and, and mm -hmm. oftentimes there's a lot of judgment. So people, so this notion that work is disincentivized, you know, if we give people enough money to, to live on and so forth. But usually what we find is that 
not, you know, not only do people like to have a paid job where they're fairly compensated for the work they put into it, people do a lot of unpaid work as well, and, and having income frees people up to do very important unpaid work, whether it's caring for, uh, for children or elderly, whether it's volunteering with, you know, after-school programs and so forth. These are all forms of work that people do on a day-to-day -day basis. And even in something like shipbuilding, I know somebody who has a friend of mine, an, an older man, has a hobby of, of building uh, boats in his backyard. And so when he comes off a hard day's work, he goes to unwind in the backyard by building a beautiful boat. Hmm. But I also have friends who build boats <laughs> for their paid job. Hmm. So how we understand work is um, it's, it's a socially constructed thing. So who's on board to establish a guaranteed minimum income in Canada? In a recent poll of Ontarians, 41% supported the idea, 33% opposed it, and 26% said they don't know. Kathleen Wynne has expressed an interest in conducting a trial project for minimum income in Ontario in 2017. In an interview with the CBC, she said, What we want people to do is build up capacity in their lives so they can be successful. We are already paying billions of dollars in terms of social assistance, so are we using that money in the best way possible? That's the question that I have for a project like this. To conclude, let us assess the facts. Clearly, there is a major problem with the way in which programs intended to combat poverty are currently structured. Escaping poverty in Canada is nearly impossible. Though it may not be a perfect model, guaranteed minimum income would be a step toward narrowing the wage gap. Guaranteed. The case studies speak for themselves. Guaranteed minimum income works. Though it is certainly a radical idea, it has the potential to make a significant difference. So what do you think? Is guaranteed minimum income risky or revolutionary?